Uh, I'm going to announce the songs in advance, and then, well, and then, we'll, and then, if, well, and then we'll start singing. Our course of the week is 273. 273. Then our uh, next next hymn is 50. And then three. Wait, no, wait, uh, wait, uh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Uh, 273 is our first hymn. Please stand if you're able. 273. Stand if you're able for our first hymn. Two, our course of the week, 273. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Here's the reason why Jesus took my burdens all away. Now I'm singing as the days go by. Jesus took my burdens all away. Once my heart was heavy with the load of sin. Jesus took my load and gave me peace within. Now I'm singing as the days go by. Jesus took my burdens all away. Amen. Right. And our next hymn is 50. 50. 5 0. 50. Yes, Power and the Blood will sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Hymn number 50. 50. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would your evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood, in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power. Wonder walking power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Must you? Would you be free from the passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's side. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder walking power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder walking power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Verse 4. Would you do service for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder walking power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder walking power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. Yes, there is. Amen. All right. At this time, we'll have Welcome in Prayer by Pastor Storm. Amen. I'll tell you what, if I had half the energy that boy does, I would be in my 30s. Amen. I'll tell you what. Um, all right. It's good to have everybody here today. Um, we need to take and turn me down just a little bit, would you? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. That's good. Um, but uh, we need to take and we need to pray for um, uh, Brother Dana. Um, talk to him this afternoon. He feels great. It's just they're trying to find what's wrong with his platelets. And uh, so he's going to be in there for a few days. And uh, then Joanne uh, texts me, and she's under the weather tonight. We need to take and pray for her. And so let's go learn prayer. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the great service we had this morning. Thank you for the decisions that were made. And Father, we just thank you most of all for loving us. Thank you for tonight that we can come into your house one more time. And Father, we thank of Dana as he's in the hospital. We thank also of, uh, of uh, Joanne as she's at home tonight. I just pray, Lord, you take and be with them. I just pray that you might touch their bodies and heal them. And uh, bring him back uh, with us very soon. We just thank you so much for everything that you've done for us. I pray now that you'll be with this service tonight, that we can say it was good to be in the house of the Lord. I just pray now that you'll be with us, guide us, and direct us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Right. Our next hymn number for tonight will be 311. 311. 311, redeemed. Redeemed, we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. 311. Redeemed, now I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. 
led him by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child from the eye of us too. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child forever I am gospel. I know I shall see in his beauty the King in whose light and light. Who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night? Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child forever. Amen. Right. Yeah. Now it's time. Now it's time for phrases. Uh, yeah, I got the one going fast. Okay. <laughs> hey, praise, praise, praise Lord for the good service that we had this morning at my dad's church, and, and like, and, and, and after the service, after the service, everyone was invited to my to my mom's husband's house, and we and, and we ate and we fellowshiped, and it was nice. It was I I, enjoy, I I enjoyed it a lot. So yeah, I praise Lord for that. It was good fellowship, good food. Yeah. Yes, no, sorry. Okay, who would like to go next? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what was the message this morning on? Oh, well, so. It was like, okay. With, yes, ma'am, sorry. Okay. Who would like to go next? Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Who would like? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Amen. Amen. Save. Who would like to go next? Yes, ma'am. Yes, we are. Excited? Save. Who would like to go next? Time we will have at this time we will have announcements by Pastor Storm. All right, we got a lot of things coming up and going on. We've got um, all week starting today is a revival every night at six o'clock. Uh, it's going to be a great week, and um, I like to see everybody here every night. It's going to be a fantastic week. We had a great morning this morning, and I can hardly wait to hear uh, the message tonight. Um, on October the uh, 11th, we've got. Uh, this coming Friday night uh, is a revival, but we're going to have Tug anyway. And I uh, want all the teenagers to be here. we got something special planned for the teenagers. And uh, so you want to be here this coming Friday night for Tug. Uh, also coming up on uh, the 12th is uh, Trap and Skeet practice. On the 13th is uh, Old Fashioned Sunday. This coming Sunday, a week from today, uh, this place is going to be transformed into an old-fashioned church. Come in your old-fashioned duds. And we're going to have a good old-fashioned um, uh, church service. And then the afternoon at 4 o'clock, we'll have dinner on the grounds. And then we'll have our evening service right after that. Uh, then on the 14th, we're back to school. 19th is uh, um, men's fellowship and also ladies' fellowship. Uh, ladies, it's going to be a, um, a baby shower for Ariana. Uh, 11 o'clock at my house. Um, you can bring your own soap and towels. Um, let's see. Didn't catch that, did you? Oh, okay. Um, then, uh, let's see. 
Uh, we got 25th and 26th as junior regionals. Uh, if you'd like to help with that, sign up in the, in the uh, foyer. Also, uh, 27th, is we've got a missionary in the morning, uh, that um, and noisy bucket. And then in the evening, we'll have our third quarter business meeting. Uh, November the 2nd is trap and skeet practice. Uh, the 6th, November 6th is question and answer. Uh, November, November, November the 8th is uh, tug. November 9th is trap and skeet. 16th is uh, uh, men's fishing trip. Um, so plan on, plan on going to that. Also, we've got ladies fellowship on the 16th, uh, tug on the 22nd, and the 24th is noisy bucket. So we've got a lot of things coming up and going on. So try to mark your calendar so you're here when you can be here. Amen. Yes. And it's good to have everybody here tonight. And now if we stand for our course of the month, hymn number 99. 99, please stand if you're able. 99. 99. Isn't he wonderful? Course of course of the month, 99. 99. Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Eyes I've seen, ears I've heard, it's recorded in God's word. Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Say hi to everyone. One more time. Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Eyes have seen, ears have heard, it's recorded in God's word. Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Amen. Amen. All right. We've got some visitors tonight, and I'd like to have you stand up and tell us who you are, if you would, please. I know we got some visitors over here. Uh, they're talking, okay? Um, we'll get them later. <laughs> All right, let's go Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for the beautiful day we've had, and we just pray now that you use these offerings for your honor and your glory. 
We thank you for the opportunity of giving back a portion of that which you've given us. I just pray now that the, these offerings be used to further the gospel in this area, and we give the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> And now it's time for our last hymn of the night, hymn from number 46, 46, for our last song for the message, 46, When I See the Blood, 46, we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4, 46, When I See the Blood. Christ, our Redeemer, died on the cross, died for the sinner, paid all his due. Sprinkle your soul with the blood of the Lamb, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I I will pass over you, vast you, chiefest of sinners, Jesus will save all he has promised that he will do. Wash in the fountain, open for sin, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I Compassion, oh boundless love, oh loving kindness, faithful and true. Thy peace and shelter under the blood, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I Special message. My wife's having a major asthma attack in my office, and uh, so we're trying to get her calmed down a little bit. And uh, so, but this time we're going to take and call on Brother Man. He's going to come and he's going to give us what God laid on his heart for tonight. I'll tell you, this morning was great. Amen. Don't quit. Amen. All right, Brother Man. And let me turn on my lapel mic here. One, two, three, testing nine, eleven, twelve. Why do we always say one, two, three? I guess it's, I guess that it's the first three numbers in existence, one, two, three, except for zero. Zero is first. But anyway, all right, well, it's good to be here, and I want to thank whoever for the stuff there. That's going to come in handy um, to help keep me cool while I'm in Africa <laughs> and all that. It's going to be exciting, I'm telling you. And uh, so thank you for that very, very much, and appreciate it. 
Um, and then, um, let's see, it, it, we, um, I'm stuttering, I'm stammering, I'm trying to think of what to say here, which is not, not usual. Usually I have plenty to say. I guess I'll get to that here in a little bit. But turn, turn to Genesis chapter number 2 while I'm stuttering and stammering here. Genesis chapter number 2 is where we want to start. And uh, I'm, I'm just excited to be here, glad to be here again. And uh, Brother and Mrs. Storm, they always, you know, they, they don't change. Um, physically, maybe we change a little bit, but <laughs> uh, they just don't change. And uh, to be here at this church again and uh, to see you folks and to meet some of you I never met before and to uh, re re get reacquainted with some old acquaintances, or some young old acquaintances, I should say. And uh, but anyway, so yes, if I had that if I had that much energy, I'd probably have a broken back, Amen. and Amen. and and my shoulder is already in bad shape. It would be in worse shape than what it is. But uh, don't let don't let that energy slip away from you, because it will eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Just go to Ecclesiastes chapter eleven or twelve, whatever it is, and you'll find that. But anyway. Um, I'm at the stage in my life where the grinders are, will, uh, will cease because they're few. I'm losing my teeth and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. But that's just age, and uh, that's okay. Um, somebody, my barber, you know, I said, I said, can you do something about my hair? He said, well, it's either going to turn loose or it's going to turn gray. Which, which do you want? And uh, in my case, it's kind of doing a little bit of both, turning loose and turning gray. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, that's okay. I, I, I <laughs> you know you're getting older when, when young men even hold the door open for you. <laughs> you know you're getting older when they do that, you know. And I'm, I'll take advantage of it. Hey, open that door for me. I'm older than you are. <laughs> and uh, But anyway, so I, I just, you know. It, it's fun. One day, one day I was um, I was on a roof. I was helping my son-in-law uh, add on to his house, and um, I was acting kind of like the general contractor because I knew more about it than what he did, and I know enough about it to get myself in trouble. But um, we were adding on to the house, and we were on top of the existing house. And, and now we're going to start building the roof to the addition from, from the existing roof uh, out. And uh, I'm up there making some figures and coming up with some ideas. And, uh, and I had a young teenager on the roof with me. And we're working away. And he, all of a sudden, he stops and looks at me. He, and he said, and this was, my goodness, 10, 12, 13 years ago. I don't know. But he looks at me. And he said, hey, brother man, he said, I hope that when I get as old as you are, that I'll be as flexible as you are. Well, about that time, I felt like I wanted to show him how flexible I was by throwing him off the roof, <laughs> by saying that I was old. But um, I can remember one time, uh, this was before our daughters started having children and what have you. I don't think any of them are even married yet. And uh, I was preaching in Missouri, and uh, I'm with a friend of mine and two of his children. Well, they're about, you know, they're about this tall. And so we're walking in towards Walmart, and, and then they, they, you know, the young lady grabbed my one hand, and her brother grabbed my other hand, and uh, they called me Grandpa. Well, I wasn't Grandpa yet. And so I said, no, I'm not going there. But I enjoy being grandpa now. <laughs> I've got 11 grandkids, and uh, I, I enjoy being around those rascals. And uh, what, what's fun is, is when, uh, you know, my, my daughters and, and their husbands are training those kids right, teaching those kids right. And, uh, you know, the, I've got three of my grandsons that are taller than me now. And uh, one of them's 17, one of them's 15, and the other is 13, and they're taller than me. And uh, so I'll start to pick something up, and they'll say, no, Papa, let me do that. Oh, okay, I'll let you do that. <laughs> That's fine with me. And, uh, but it's, it's fun. It really, really is. Uh, it's difficult because every time I sit down, I grunt, and every time I stand up, I grunt. Uh, so you know you've gotten old when every time you sit down, you grunt, and you stand up, you grunt. So anyway, that's just the way it is with pain and everything else. 
I don't get much sleep at night um, because of that. I'll sleep on one shoulder for a while and it, get, it starts hurting. And I wake up and I turn over and I sleep on this one for a while until it uh, starts hurting. Then I'll sleep on my back and I usually end up snoring and my wife has to get up and go to another room. And uh, so I don't sleep on my back very much. I, but I, it's just sleep just comes and goes. And it, that, that, the, the Bible talks about all that. The Bible talks about all that, so I'm not worried about it one bit. Uh, it's just a natural progression in life. But anyway, uh, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to be talking about life. We're going to be talking about life and um, adding with that the, uh, the theme uh, for the week. And, uh, but I want you to be back tomorrow night now. Six o'clock, you say? Okay, be back tomorrow night at six o'clock. I've got a message. I, I might change tomorrow night's message to another message. And um, but I might put some of it in here in with this, but we'll see. Um, but I want you to make sure and come back tomorrow night, 6 o'clock, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, each evening at 6 o'clock. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and bring your friends, bring your uh, relatives, bring your work co-workers, bring whoever, and uh, especially if they're not saved. Because uh, yeah. if you bring a friend or you bring a visitor... And, and they're not saved. It, it, when you bring someone, make sure and let me know that they're here and uh, if they're saved or not, okay? And uh, so, so just, just make sure and do that, all right? This is revival, revival. This <laughs> revival means we get revived. Revival gets, means we get back to where we were. And, um, and so I don't know where you were, and I don't know where you need to get. Um, but I know that since I got saved in 1973, so that wall represents 1973, and that wall represents the day that I die and go into heaven. And uh, I don't know where I am in this line. I know I'm over halfway, <laughs> and uh, I, I know I'm not perfect yet. I know I still have problems and all this kind of thing. Um, but I want when when I get there, I don't want him to look at me and like I said this morning, I don't want him to look at me and say, well. I want him to hear. I want to hear him say, "Well done, Amen. Amen. well done." And Christianity with me is not just a Sunday thing; it's a it's an everyday thing, and uh, it's every day and every month and every year uh, for the rest of my life. So, uh, which is why, again, I I I, I kind of got. I don't know. We've been we've been very busy this year. We've been we're more busy this year than uh, previous years. And part of the reason is because of that camper that we have. We're able to pull that thing every, every place and, and kind of go out from the camper and, and preach in a lot of churches. And, uh, but I, I, came, I came to a point a month or so ago where I, where I wasn't satisfied with what I was doing with, with uh, some things. And, and I asked myself the question, what am I doing to get the gospel out? What am I doing to get the gospel out? Now, but you say, Brother Man, you've been preaching for over 40 years. What do you mean, what are you doing to get the gospel out? I, I ask myself the question, what am I doing to get the gospel out? Well, but Brother Man, you've been, you've been preaching since 1975. You've been getting the gospel out. No, 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 no. I became dissatisfied with it, and I said, I said to myself, what am I doing to get the gospel out? When they asked me to go to Zimbabwe with them, I said, that's it right there. I'm going to go into an area of the world where there is no preaching. David Livingston did some preaching in that area. Right down the road is a town by the name of Livingston. Right down the road are the Victoria Falls, where he was and where he passed through there. Um, and to this day, to this day, they still talk about the doctor, referring to, doc, to David Livingston. In that part of the world, they still, they still talk about the doctor. In that part of the world, the, the dress standards are, are better in those people than some of the other people in other parts of Africa. Why? Because of the doctor, because of David Livingston. And so I, I, want, to, I, want, to leave, I want to leave a footprint. So we're going to go into that area. And I mentioned this morning, there are, some, there are some needs that we have. Now, this organization that we're starting, of course, it is through our church. And, uh, but we're, we're calling it the Samaritan Servants International. And we are just, a lot of it is, is laymen, people who are not preachers. And, um, but they have a desire to do something for God with their life. 
And so maybe they came to a point in their life where they said, what am I doing to spread the gospel? Uh, but we have one pastor from one church in Henderson, Texas. He's going, and he's in charge of drilling the well and feeding 500 families. That, that's what he, for that, that week, we're feeding 500 families. We're not only feeding them, but we're giving them seeds to plant so they can grow their own food. But we're not only going to do that, but we're going to teach them how to, we're talking about teaching them how to, when they grow that food, how to set aside some of those seeds and uh, for, the next, for the next time that they can plant. Because normally what they do, because they are so hungry, because, because there's such a lack of food over there, uh, they just eat everything. And uh, so they've got to think about the future. Uh, Zimbabwe... Uh, we tried to, the, for the, um, I'm just telling you a little bit about this, the, uh, for the, for the will, drilling, drilling of the water well, the guys who's going to drill the water well over there, he wants half the money up front. So we try, that's okay, we, you just owe me a pizza. And uh, <laughs> we, they, want, they want half the money up front. So the, the, the pastor from Henderson, Texas, who's part of our team, he was trying to send them the money. He was trying to, you know, uh, get the money to them, uh, to wire the money to them. And the government has made such bad decisions in Zimbabwe, uh, especially the, in the past year, that they stopped all outside money coming into the country. They, they started a new uh, a dollar. They started their new monetary system in, in June. And at that time... Um, you could trade one American dollar for about two and a half of their dollars. That was in June. Just a few days ago, the ratio was 12 to 1. I could give them one dollar, and they would give me 12. Okay? Think about the price of everything over there with that kind of ratio. The next day, it went from 12 to 1 to 15 to 1. And so the government, their, their monetary system, their finances are, are just in a wreck. And the, the major thing that they did, that they did incorrectly, is they sold all their resources to China. Mm -hmm. And because they sold all their resources to China, now they don't have any assets where they can borrow money from the International Monetary Fund. And so they're just in a mess. They are just in a mess. They hardly have, the country hardly has enough money to pay for enough food for the people and for enough gas. Imagine, if you will, if you want to, let's say you want to go to an ATM machine. Here, you don't think about it. Over there, you will stand in line for two, three, and four hours, hoping that by the time you get to the ATM machine, there's some money in it. And if there's not... You come back another day. Imagine at any time you want to buy gasoline, you have to get in line for two and three and four hours. Now, this is not just once or twice. This is all the time. And if, if you get there and, and, there's an up, and there's some gas left in the, in the pump, then you can buy it. But at a ratio of 15 to 1, you know that price is going to be very, very high. Their, um, I think it's their interest is like 900 percent, and uh, so it's just it's just un unbelievable. So we really don't know what we're facing when we go into Zimbabwe uh, financially. Um, are we going to be able to pay for the materials for the tabernacle? Will they take our money? Um, it was I was told that if you know if I'm. I'm Everybody needs to take some money when they go over there. I'm not going to take very much, um, but we need to do that uh, in case we need to buy something. But if you try to trade your money for their money, they can arrest you. So we have to be very, very careful. Uh, the government doesn't want anybody coming over there and taking pictures of, their, of the government buildings. Um, they, we were told that we will have somebody watching us all the time, and if we say anything negative against the government, then, then we'll be asked to leave and the whole thing. And so it's, it's a very volatile situation. It's the 30th most dangerous country in the world uh, to visit, uh, but I, I have found some consolation in, in the list. 
because even more dangerous than Zimbabwe is the nation of Israel to visit. More dangerous than Zimbabwe is India, and I've been to India, and I'm planning on going back with one of our teams in the near future, probably. Um, another country that is more dangerous than Zimbabwe is the Philippines, and another da- a country that is more dangerous than Zimbabwe is Mexico, and I've been into Mexico. Now, not all parts of Mexico and not all parts of Philipp- the Philippines but there are dangerous areas. And, uh, but the biggest danger there is, of course, the uh, crime element. Uh, they'll try to rob you. They'll try to uh, hijack your truck if you're driving one or whatever. And uh, so pray for our health. <laughs> pray for our safety. And uh, if you would, I'm looking forward to it. I really am. I, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be fine. We've had men go over there by themselves and, and set up a tent, and, and sleep in the tent, cook their own food, and teach the nationals there. And he was there by himself, and everything, everything was fine. So I'm not expecting any trouble. Um, but there, it's just a poor, very, very, very poor country, and uh, we want to help them uh, the best we can while we're there. And uh, I'm, I'm already coming up with some ideas where we will go back, hopefully in about six months. A, a team of us will go back in about six months, and we'll have a Bible-slash-mission conference Try to get all the people that we've preached to and the, and the people that, uh, that uh, we will gather together, even on this trip, get all those together in one location and have, have, a, have a Bible training time and a, and a mission time. They need to understand that they need to reach their people. They need to understand that they need to go to the next village. When I was in India, I'll tell you this and we'll get into the message, but when I was in India a few years ago, nobody paid for that trip for me. Um, if you remember, I used to bring my bicycle with me, and I'd ride all over the place. I rode, I rode my bicycle from Coolidge to here and back, and uh, that, to me, in those, that, was not, that was nothing. I mean, I'd ride 50 and 60 miles with no problem. I don't do that as much as I used to because I've had two wrecks and uh, went headfirst over my handlebars, cracked my ribs, and uh, did some other damage, but I, I still ride my bicycle. But I, the, the way I got my, the way I paid my way to India was I trained for uh, uh, quite a few months, and then on one, on one day in Ohio, I rode my bicycle 100 miles in six hours and 22 minutes. That was riding time. And uh, I raised money that way so I could go to India. Well, I'm in India, and the next to the last day that I'm in India, they take me out into a, an, out into a village, and uh, they're in the jungle. And in that part of India is the best, it's one of the best places, or it has the most, it has the, uh, it's one of the most populated areas for Bengal tigers in the world. I didn't see one, and I don't know if one of them saw me, <laughs> but, but that's where we were. And uh, so we're out in, the, out, in this, out in this village, and uh, the people make $2 a day picking tea leaves. That's all they do is pick tea leaves. They're great big tea fields. Uh, out in out in around the village, and they'd go out there and pick those tea leaves. They took me out. They they wanted to take me out into the into the field, and so we went out in the field, and and uh, they stopped and said, "Now you got to jump over this hole." And so we jumped over the hole. And I've got my iPad with me, you know, and I'm taking pictures and all this because we're right next to Nepal, right next to Nepal, and uh, the eastern part of Nepal, really really close to the uh, the Himalaya Mountains, which I was in the foothills of the Himalaya Mountains for a little bit. And, uh, but we were there in that village and, you know, we, we, they showed me everything and they showed me, you know, they picked the tea leaves and we're walking back towards the village and I raised my, my uh, iPad to take a picture of the village and as soon as I pushed, you know, the screen on my iPad, I fell in that hole <laughs> and that was not good. But I, I was preaching there in that church that the people that make $2 a day um, they saved up the money, they made the cement block, they built the building. There were no windows in the openings for a window, they were just, they were just openings. Um, they would go in, the floor was dirt, um, the roof, you know, it had metal, corrugated metal on the roof and everything. And so there were cement block walls, metal corrugated roof, um, and basically that was it, and dirt floors. They would go in and make a lot of noise before anybody else would go in there to make sure there are no snakes in there, okay? You know, the kind that come up with the hood and they spit in your face and then they bite you and all that stuff. And uh, so they chase any of those out if there are any. 
And then before you go in the church, you have to take your shoes off. Before you go into any building, anybody's house, you take your shoes off. Okay, so uh, you, you go into the door, uh, main door of the church. There's only one door, and uh, there's a bunch of shoes right there and sandals and whatever. But I, but I get in there, and uh, the pastor who, who interpreted for me, um, he asked the people. He had the men uh, sitting on the ground on this side. They would unroll some carpet or some, uh, some rugs. They would roll these rugs out, and the men would sit on this side. As you're looking out, the ladies would sit on this side. And uh, so I, he, he said that, you know, he started talking to them. And one of the men raised his hand, and he said something in their language, and he interpreted for me. What the, man, what the man said was this. He said, I know a man in the next village. We need to go to the next village, and we need to win him to Christ. He's my friend. I want, we need to go to the next village and, and win that man to Christ. He sat down. Another man raised his hand, and he said in his language basically the same thing. He said, oh, and you need to come with me and go to this other village over here because there's no preaching over there, and I want my friends to be saved over there. I want my family over there to be saved. Everybody in their own nation is supposed to win their own people of their own nation. Amen. We've got to do it. So we want to go back over there and teach them about the Bible. They know nothing about, they know nothing about the Bible. The Bible that they have is from the wrong line of manuscripts. It has verses that are missing and what have you, in their language. We are going to replace those Bibles with whole Bibles. Now, they're not King James Bibles because these are, these are Bibles from the Trinitarian Bible Society in England in their language, and they are uh, from the right uh, line of manuscripts, and, and they have all the, all the words and all the verses in them. And so <clears throat> we want to go back. But um, you cannot, they, they cannot depend on the American missionary coming over there and winning their people. They are there. They know the language. They know how to, how to where, the, where, the, where they go. So they need to go to the next village. We'll help them as much as we can, but they need to go to the next village. So you, you pray that we'll have some men. We've already got some men that, over there that are excited. They're, they're, those people are excited about us coming. <laughs> they're, they're just so happy that we are coming because we're going to save them a 12-mile one-way walk to get water. And we're coming over there and preaching the gospel to them and putting up a, putting up a shell of a building so they have a place to meet in, in that village. And so please pray uh, as, we, as we do that. And we're going to do it all. My, myself and two others are going over on the 7th. The rest of them are coming over on the 11th, and we're leaving on the 22nd. So we only have 10, 11 days uh, to get the job done. And uh, so you pray that we can pay for everything and get everything done and uh, raise the money. Uh, to do it. It's going to cost around $45,000 total. Um, it's around $12,000 just, just, just for the tickets to get over there and back, and then some motel expense and what have you. So, um, and, and, the, and this money is coming in. This money is coming in from different people and from churches and, and individuals. And so, and then our church back home, they're, they're, they're a big part of it. Uh, they're a big part of it. Then we have some people that have their own businesses, and they are and they are donating uh, good chunks of money. So, you know, it, it's all it, it'll get there. It'll get there, and uh, we might have to go in the hole for a little bit, but we'll pay it off later. Is what we'll do. Uh, but Genesis Genesis chapter number two. I'm going to read the first eight verses. Genesis chapter two and the first eight verses there of Genesis chapter number two. It says, "Thus the heavens and the earth were finished," which is one reason I do not believe in evolution because the heavens and the earth were finished. They did, you know, they did not just set in process in motion and it evolved. The heavens and the earth were finished and, uh, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had, rest, in, in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Uh, next verse, verse number three. And Adam lived an hundred. No, I skipped. I skipped a page. I skipped a page. These pages are thin in this little Bible. In the fifth day, the Lord made the heaven, uh, the uh, earth and the heavens. Verse five. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. There was not a man to till the ground. 
But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Father, thank you for the day now, and I pray just as we preached this morning and taught in Sunday school um, about having that fire uh, down, in, down inside of us to keep going, I pray, Father, that you'll help us this evening as we look at some verses and some thought, and uh, everybody's thought about these things, everybody knows about these things, but help us, Father, and speak to our hearts tonight to, uh, to have a fire uh, in our life uh, about what we can do for you. And uh, Father, we thank you uh, for this morning and uh, look forward to what's going to happen tonight and the decisions that are made. In Jesus' name, amen. The word entrusted. Um, my son-in-law in Boise, I preached a, a four-day meeting for him just a couple months ago. And... Um, he advertised on the, on the revival information that we we're going to preach, you know, how, how God has entrusted us with certain things. And so I picked up on that word entrusted, entrusted. The word entrusted means to put something uh, into someone's care or protection, okay? And so he, you, give somebody, you, give, you give something to somebody and you say, take care of this for me. And so, Brother Chuck, I'm going to give you my wallet here, and I want you to take care of my wallet. Now, on the outside, it says there's one dollar bill, and, on, and there's some other bills in there. There's a 10, and there's a 20, and what have you, and uh, that's the money I have uh, to, to bring with me so I can do things during the day if I need to, whatever. So there's my wallet. I want you to take care of that for me. I am entrusting you with my wallet, Okay. Now, it, that word in trust has the word trust in it. Okay, there go the kids. All right. It has the word trust in it. I am trusting you that when I ask for my wallet back, everything will be in there. Sure. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> okay. So there's my wallet. It's got my credit card in there. It's got uh, my debit card in there to my bank account. It's got my brand new driver's license in there. I just got this past week. It's got my concealed carry license in there that says veteran on the top of it, which means I only have to pay $25 to, in, order, in order to re-up that thing. It's got all that in there. Um, it's got some other things in there, too. Um, it's got a card in there where I can get in any state or national park for free, anywhere. And that price of that thing has gone up to $80. I got it when it was $25. And, uh, and, and it saved us a bunch of money going into different parks. So I'm, I'm trusting him with my wallet, with my money with my credit card, debit card, license plate, the whole thing. I'm trusting him with that. Now, if I did not trust him, I would not give that to him. Okay. So as I was standing up here, preacher, thinking about who can I give that to, I thought about Chuck and I thought about you. And I said, I'm going to give it to Chuck. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so I'm just kidding. And, uh, but, uh, but anyway... So, I mean, in, you know, if I need to chase you, I think I'm a little bit faster than you are. So, by the way, there, there's, a, there's a law in, in Africa. There's a law in Africa that if a lion starts running towards you, all you have to do is be faster than the other guy. Okay. So I'll be the oldest one. I think I'll be the oldest one over there, so I think I'm in trouble. <laughs> but anyway... Um, but no, I, I think some of the rest of them are not in as good a shape as I am because I still ride a bicycle and they don't. But anyway, the, but the word entrusted means to put something into someone's care or protection. God has entrusted to us, that's the end of the illustration, I'm, I'm just taking it back. <laughs> and uh, wait a minute, let me check. But anyway, 
God has entrusted to mankind. He said, he said I'm going to make mankind, and I'm going, in, I'm going to entrust some things to them. He said, I'm going to entrust the plant to you. Uh, you're, you're supposed to take care of it for me. Uh, the animals, uh, all these kind of things. But there's one thing that he gave us that he has trusted us with that we need to make sure that we are taken care of, and that is our life. Amen. Our life. What is, what is I, I can't remember who it was. I think I have it written down, but I looked it up at one time, but I found out who it was that wrote that poem um, and part of, only part of the poem, it says, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's just part of a poem. Just a part of the poem. But that's the part that we know. That's the part that we remember. I mentioned this morning that some years ago there was a commercial on television which was against drugs. And it said, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Now, on, uh, on Thursday, uh, like I told you this morning, I, I got up at 3.15, took my wife to the airport so she could fly to be with our daughter, help them move and unpack and all that. <clears throat> and then I had to go to that court uh, thing to um, uh, testify in favor of a young man who had gotten himself in trouble again. He was going to go to prison for anywhere from two to ten years. He'd already been in, in jail for 11 months. And uh, so we went there, myself and two other men, trying to convince the court that give this guy a chance and what have you. But they ended up giving him the maximum. And so he's in prison now for ten years. And, uh, but I, I went there, and, and as I sat there, he and I, many times when he was not in trouble, he and I would sit in Sunday school class and just talk about all sorts of things. And now I am, there I am sitting behind him in the courthouse, in, the, in that room, the judge sitting up there and his attorney here and the state prosecuting attorney over here. And I'm sitting there looking at the back of, of Josh's head and I'm thinking to myself, he is absolutely wasted his life. wasted his life. Josh is a very smart young man, but he, started, he, he got into this bad habit of stealing things. And then he got caught one time with some substance on, his, on, on, on him. And, but he's been in and out of detention centers and in and out of prison. He's been charged, caught, 15 times. He's 38 years old. He has nothing. My wife's brother, Jerry, lives in Colorado Springs, Colorado. He's in his early 60s. The reason he's in Colorado Springs, Colorado, is because that's where his parole officer is. I cannot tell you how many times Jerry has been in and out of prison. And as soon as he gets out, he finds somebody to shack up with, and he does something stupid again, and he ends up back in jail again. His first wife died of cancer. They had, I think, three children, a set of twins and another child. One time, and, and I've talked with this daughter, one time when she was about 15 years old, she had a child out of wedlock. She still hasn't. Well, I think she's going to get married or something, but anyway. But now she's in her 30s or early 40s. And, uh, but anyway, somehow, as, as a 15-year-old with a baby, she got on a plane to fly out to Colorado. Her dad said that he would meet her at the airport 
and he would take her back to where he lived and all this. She got to where she was flying to with a baby. She had no food left. She had no money, and she had no diapers. And there she is sitting in an airport waiting for her dad to come and pick her up and help take care of her. He never showed up. He just didn't show up. He just didn't show up. Somehow or other, that girl pulled herself up by the bootstraps and made something of her life. Somehow. The rest of the family, no. But Jerry has no interaction at all with any of his family. When my wife's dad died a couple years ago in September, a couple years ago in September, uh, we were there, and... Uh, but before he died, my wife got on the phone with him. They found where he was, found a phone number, and my wife was talking to him. And this is what he said. He said, well, I'll get there if I can. But I got to find out if I can get out of state and da, 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 da. She, she hung up, and I, and I looked at my wife, and I said, Sherry, I've heard enough conversations like that to know he is not coming. He's not coming. He didn't come to his own dad's funeral, and he could have, except because, he, because he's wasted his life, because he has spent his whole life with stinking thinking, because he spent his whole life in and out of prison, I doubt that he even had any kind of money to help him get from Colorado to Ohio to be at his dad's funeral. When his mom dies, she's still alive, but she's in, in pretty rough shape. Mentally, she's great, but physically, she's just, you know, all her bones are brittle. Her, her vertebrae and her, and her backbone, they're just cracked all over the place, and she's, you know, very in a lot of pain. So when she passes, I'm sure Jerry won't show up. Not only is it a horrible thing to waste a mind, but it's a horrible thing to waste a life. It's a horrible thing. But God has entrusted to us life. He said in verse number 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And then he gave him responsibility there in verses 8 through 14 and then 15 through the rest and all that. But here, here's, what I have, here's what I have here. Life is short. <laughs> I'm finding that out. I can remember very, very clearly as a 10-year-old boy, I was, sitting, I was sitting down in one of the rooms of our house, and I was thinking, I was 10 years old, and I was thinking to myself there, I said, wow, I'm 10 years old. When I'm twice as old as what I am now, I'll be 20. To me, that was so stinking old. I thought, my goodness, 20 years old? Well, to be back at 20 again. <laughs> A few years ago when I was pastoring, between, I was pastoring between 1982 and 1995 at the church that I started in Ohio, and one day I, came, I was driving into town, and we had our driveway that went back to the church, and on the outside of the driveway, we had railroad ties out there, just to kind of mark where the edge was, and somebody had bumped into one of those railroad ties, turning around or doing something, and a man was standing in the ditch there, and he was working on that with a shovel, and I stopped and I said, Everett, what in the world are you doing? It was summertime in Ohio. It was hot, actually hot in Ohio. And I looked at him. He had had a heart attack not too long before this. And he's standing there sweating. He's, he's overweight. And he's digging and trying to get the stones and trying to do I said, I said, what, Everett, what are you doing? And I, I took my, loosened my tie. I said, give me the shovel, man. And I took the shovel. And he, was, he was in his 60s. I was, I was 40, I believe it was. As I'm standing there moving these rocks and everything, and he's over here huffing and puffing, sitting on the edge of the, on the, edge of the uh, ditch over here, I'm standing there thinking to myself, man, if I was just half the age of what I am now, I was wishing to be 20 years old. 
at the exact same time that I'm thinking that, Everett sat there in his 60s, and he said, man, I wish I was 20 years younger. He was wishing to be my age, and I was wishing to be you know, 20 years younger than, than that. But life is short. In, in James, chapter, James chapter number 4 and, and Proverbs chapter number 27, it talks about how brief life is. And I, I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it when I was your age. And I'm, and I'm thinking, you know, how, how old are you now, son? How old are you? 11 years old. I mean, ripe, old, 11 years old. And, and I'm telling you, you know, I, I always hated it when I got around my grandparents because they, all, all they talked about was, you, did you hear about somebody who, so-and-so he died and so-and-so she died and this person has cancer? And I'm thinking, well, wow, you know, is that all you people can talk about? And now that I'm 68, almost 69, I, I'm, I've got a friend over here that died and I got a friend I just found out who's got prostate cancer and I got a friend over here that's got this problem and a friend over here that's got this problem. And uh, things start falling apart in our bodies and our eyes. We get the cataracts, and they tell you they tell you that if you want to, if you don't want to have cataracts, always wear sunglasses. And so I've got a pair of sunglasses around here somewhere that I wear all the time. And uh, but but uh, life is quick. But you know, I I told my wife one day. I said, you know, life every year is going by so fast. You know, every every time I turn around, another year goes by. So I looked at her and I said, I'm going to stop turning around. But it didn't work. Turn the other way. Turn the other way. Rewind. <laughs> I haven't found that button yet. And, uh, but life is short. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, it tells us what to do. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Listen to me. God entrusted life with us. He is the one who, who formed us of the dust of the ground. He is the one who breathed into man's nostrils and gave him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And he gave us responsibilities to take care of the things that he had, that he had provided for us and that he had spoken into existence. And we still have that responsibility, and we still need to, and we still need to take care of those things. I, I've got a whole message on health. I've got a whole message on health. I, brought my, I took my bicycle one time to Arkansas, and I'm riding my bicycle. And, I'm, and I talked to the pastor, and he said, he said I'm worried about my wife because he's always drinking uh, Diet Coke. Well, I just had a friend recently who died of cancer. And he, he would drink three and four and five and six cans of Diet Coke every day. And they say that stuff will, will cause cancer. But anyway, I don't know. Besides that, he did smoke for a while, and that'll do it too. But I have this message, and so the pastor said, and I told him, I said, well, I've got a message on health if you'd want me to preach it. He said, would you? I said, yeah, I'll preach it. <laughs> so I had my bicycle there, and, and I was in the, in the prophet's chamber there in, in the church building, and I brought that thing out and put it up front. And the pastor, he tried to get on that thing. Well, he didn't know that you have to lean it down and, and then swing your leg over. He's having it straight up and down trying to get his leg over in his, in his suit pants, you know, and all this. I said, no, 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 no. So you'll be tearing your pants and you'll be suing me for it. But anyway, <coughs> so <coughs> I, preached that, I preached that message on health. And it was quiet. I, I have a doctor's degree, but I'm not a physician. But there are some things in the Bible about taking care of, of the temple of God. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. We only have right now. You only have this moment. When I was 11... 10, 9, 8, somewhere in that area. I thought only old people died. Because <clears throat> the only funerals we went to were people with gray hair. Grandmas and grandpas. Old people. You know, in their 70s. Notice how I said that? I'm not 70 yet. But anyway, <clears throat> and when I'm 70, I'll say in their 80s. Old people. 
There was a young boy down the road. He was about my age, 8, 9, 10, 11 years old. And he had some sickness of some sort. I didn't know what it was. I didn't understand it. One day, my dad came home from work. He leaned over to my mom, and he said, did you hear about the Boggs boy? Mom said, no, what? He died. I heard that, and I thought, but only old people die. You can go to any cemetery, and you'll see tombstones of babies. You'll see tombstones of young children. You'll see tombstones of teenagers. You'll see tombstones of people in their 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s and even 100s. And there's no guarantee that you have tomorrow. I was witnessing in, in North Carolina, the pastor and I. We were walking in this trailer park <clears throat> just down the road from the church, and I tried to witness to a, a young lady. She was in her early 20s. She didn't want to hear it. She didn't want to hear it. She said, no, I don't want to hear it. So I said, okay. So we went down the road, and, and we got done there. And the next, the next day, when I met up with the pastor, he said, do you remember the young lady you tried to witness to yesterday? I said, yeah. He said, she's dead. What? There was no sickness. There was, what happened? She simply walked out in the street in front of her trailer, didn't see the car coming. The car hit her and killed her. Just like that. I was just witnessing to people in Idaho going out soul winning, trying to get people to come to church. I knocked on a door. A lady came to the door. She opened the door, and this is what she said. She said, I am not a Christian, and I don't want to be a Christian. And shut the door. That's your choice. But one day, you're going to die. One day the news will get out that you passed away. Only one life will soon be passed. And only what's done for Christ will last. You say, but I'm working a good job. I'm making good money. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Are you listening to me? How many of you have known somebody totally unexpectedly, all of a sudden, they're gone? They passed away. Maybe a family member, maybe a brother, maybe a sister, maybe somebody. But if you listen to me, we don't know what is going to happen. So i got to ask you the question, what are you doing with your life? a serious subject tonight. I'd rather preach on heaven and have everybody hallelujah and praising God, but we're not there yet. There needs to be something inside of you that says, I am going to live my life for God, because ultimately we will stand before him. And we will give an answer for all the things that we've done in this body, whether they be good or bad. The Bible says we can stand before him with confidence and not be ashamed. The Bible says that. You can look it up. It says we can stand before him with confidence and not be ashamed. The lawyer asked me the other day, he said, he said, Mr. Mann, do you believe a person can change? 
And I said, absolutely. He said, well, how do you think a person can change? And I'm sitting in the witness box, and I said, well, there are two ways that a person can change. Number one, they can trust Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And I said, I know that from personal experience, because before I got saved, I was doing a lot of drinking, I was smoking a lot of dope, and when I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I changed. I stopped doing those things immediately. Are you with, are you with me? I said, the second way a person can change is they can choose to change. I said, there are a lot of people that have never trusted Christ as their personal Savior, but they made the choice to stop doing something that they were doing, or they made the decision to start doing something that they needed to be doing, and because of that decision, they changed. There are plenty of people who have never been saved, but they've turned over a new leaf. There are plenty of people, I, 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 you know, I, I exercise, I take vitamins, I do all these kinds of things and everything. And, and I've seen people, they would go into the, into the gym and they would work up a sweat and they would exercise and, and they'd come out with a big muscles and then they'd, get, they'd go in and they'd take the shower and they'd come out from the gym and they'd go to the bar right next door and, and get half soused on alcohol. There was a man some years ago, he made commercials on television. He was one of the health gurus, and, and he was doing a lot of running and all this kind of thing. And all of a sudden, one day, he died of a heart attack. Are you with me? She owes me another pizza. <laughs> so, is that yours again? Yeah? Okay. No, that's all right. That's all right. I'll take my hearing aids out. That way I won't hear it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I don't want to waste my life. And because I don't want to waste my life, preacher, there are things that I do that, that, that I know pleases God, and there are some things that I don't do that I know displeases God. I don't want to waste my life on drugs. I, I've seen people uh, lay, laying on their own vomit. I've seen people as they lay there. I've got friends that are in the grave right now because they overdosed and they did all sorts of dumb things with drugs and alcohol. And I'm not going to waste my life that way. And somebody who names the name of Christ, you're supposed to take those things and get rid of those things and get those things out of your life. And don't tamper with it and don't fool with it because all that kind of stuff will do is draw you away from serving Christ. Get a fire down inside of you that says, I don't care what the television says. I don't care what the billboards say. I am not going to drink that alcohol. I'm not going to even have it in my house. I'm not going to be controlled by those things. And I'm not even going to be controlled by my stinking cell phone. I see it all the time. I even joke around with people about it. I, there, was a, there was a couple one time sitting at a table in a, in a place in Missouri where there was some great ice cream. And uh, <laughs> it was um, black walnut ice cream. Oh, my goodness. Fresh from the black walnut place, place. And oh, my goodness, it's so good. Forget about this health thing. Give me some black walnut ice cream. And I'm in this shop, and there's this young man sitting there with his laptop. And a young lady sitting at the same table with her laptop. The laptops were back to back, and they're just sitting there just typing and typing and typing. I stood there, and I'm licking on my ice cream cone, and, and I just stand there looking at them right next to them. Pretty soon, they both looked up at me. I said, uh, are you guys texting each other? Well, you're not talking. You're a guy, and you're a girl, and you're sitting there at the same table, and you're not even looking at each other. You're not... I refuse, to be ten I, I refuse to be controlled by my cell phone. I refuse to be controlled by my laptop. I refuse to be controlled by the television. Amen. I don't want to waste my life. Now, when it's Green Bay and Dallas, I'm going to waste my life. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to find some way to make it spiritual. <laughs> I'm not going to waste my life with immorality. One of the best pieces of advice I got about marriage came from a friend of mine that I worked with right after I got married. trying to be very delicate with this. 
but he said this. He looked at me and he said, he said, Gary, it makes no sense to commit adultery. It makes no sense to commit adultery. And he followed that up with something else. He said, it makes no sense to commit adultery because everybody's made the same way. You get my idea? I said, wow. But I know people. I know a young lady. <clears throat> Her name was Rita. And I usually talk about Rita and a, and a guy by the name of Ricky with young people. And I think I've done it here for Tug one time. That Rita was a young lady that was going to church with us when, we, when, I, first, when I got saved. And young, attractive young lady. Teenager, 13, 14 years old. <clears throat> when Rita got a little bit older, all of a sudden, instead of going to Sunday school and church, she disappeared. She was always faithful to church, always. She always read her Bible. She always had her Bible with her. All of a sudden, she's not in church anymore. Hmm. Later on, come to find out, she was expecting a baby. And I know the young man. He's grown up and he's got his own family now that she had. Well, after a while, Rita kind of disappeared again. My wife and I, I went off to Bible college. I graduated and started a church. <clears throat> One day in my church service, all of a sudden, Rita and a young man come walking in the door. She's in her 20s now. She had given up the baby that she had. Matter of fact, her mom reared her boy and Rita comes walking in just out of the blue she came in and introduced the young man that she was with and she said um, she called me Gary because we've known, e known each other for years she said Gary um, we would like for you to marry us I said oh wow well what I normally do is I sit down with whoever and I counsel them two or three times and if they still want me to marry them then we'll talk about it. She said okay that's fair. She started to come to church with him and all of a sudden she stopped again. I went to the house <clears throat> and when I went into the house she was living with her mom and dad again. When I went into the house it was very very quiet and I said what's going on? They said, well, didn't you hear? I said, no, what? And I can't think of his name. I'll just call him Tom. Tom left. He disappeared. That was the young man that, was, that Rita was going to marry. I said, wow. Well, what happened? Oh, we don't know. But they did. Before Rita met Tom, she committed immorality with the young man one time. one time and either that young man didn't know or he didn't tell her that he had AIDS and because Rita committed immorality with a young man one time she now had AIDS when Tom found out about it he's gone haven't seen him since. But I saw Rita for the next two years. As she was in and out of the hospital, this is when AIDS first came on the scene. She was in the hospital one time with pneumonia. She was laying in the bed. She was perspiring because of the fever. The people that delivered the food wouldn't even come in the room. 
because they were afraid of catching AIDS. My wife bends over and kisses Rita on the forehead, and she's perspiring. And I'm standing there thinking, does my wife now have AIDS? She didn't. I didn't. In and out of the hospital. Finally, <clears throat> her mom, who is one of my heroes, and I've told her that, her mom spent the next year and a half taking care of her daughter, who was very, very slowly dying from AIDS because of one act of immorality. My mom and dad always taught me this. They said, Gary, it only takes one time to mess up your life. And because of that, I can honestly stand here and tell you that I kept that purity until after I said, I do. Because I didn't want to mess up my life and somebody else's life and their parents' life. I only have one life. I only have one body that's been given to me. And at 68, almost 69 years old, I'll be 69 a week from Thursday. Happy birthday to me. I can still get on a bicycle. I know a lot of people my age can't. There's, there's just no way they can. And I understand that because of physical problems. I, I get it. I'm, I've been blessed. I've got two hands I can use. Yeah, I know. So I doubt that you could do what I can do. But you can do what I can't do. You do one with one hand. I'd, be, I'd have all sorts of problems. <laughs> I'd be getting so frustrated. I visited with Rita on a Thursday night. Her eyes were sunk back in her head. It was just nothing but skin and skeleton laying there. Her mom had to change her diaper. Her mom had to feed her. Dad left because of the pressure and the stigma. He, he just left. He left the family. I visited with Rita on Thursday. On Monday, she died. Because she committed immorality one time. She was saved, but she made some horrible decisions in her life. I don't remember her for the good things that she did. The story I tell about Rita is she died of AIDS. But before she died, she told her mom this. She said, I know the reason I'm dying is because I turned my back on God and the Bible. It's not worth it. God has entrusted life to us. We need to keep that fire going inside of us that says, I don't care what, what kind of shape I get into. I don't care how old I get. <coughs> I don't care if my throat closes up on me while I'm speaking. I don't care what happens to me. My, my voice is getting gravelly, and it's, and it's hard many times for me to get things out. I, I don't care. I don't care what's going on. I'm not going to let immorality ruin my life. I'm not going to let drugs ruin my life. I'm not going to let uh, pornography uh, ruin my life. I'm not going to let alcohol ruin my life. I want to live my life. I want to, I'm going to control what I do and control where I go and, and be careful what I listen to. I'm going to be involved in things that are eternal and I want, to, I want to spend the rest of my life doing things where I'll leave a footprint behind me and God will honor and then and again, God, God will actually say, well done. Amen. I got to ask the questions. Does where you go glorify God? Does where you go glorify God? Does what you do glorify God? Is there something at home right now? 
that you know. And I'm going to preach that message tomorrow night. That something I'm going to share something with you, some things that keep me going. And I want to share that thing. But I, is there something at home right now <clears throat> that you know should not be there? Are you being controlled by something? Okay, Achan, he stole some garments and he stole some wedges of silver and gold, I think it was. How much did he enjoy those garments? How much did he enjoy? Was he able to spend that money? He hid it under the rug in his tent. And when he thought nobody was looking, he would flip that rug back. He would look at those Babylonian garments and those wedges of silver and gold. And he'd hear somebody and have to put it back down and cover it up real quick. Is there something like that at your house right now? It's time to clean house. And I'm not talking about dust. Amen. Serious subject tonight, isn't it? Well, this is revival. I'm not supposed to tickle your ears. This is revival. I'm not, go I'm not supposed to say, oh, everything's all right. I know you have this or that, but don't worry about it. I've seen what alcohol does. I've experienced what alcohol does. I'm almost done. I played in rock and roll band. I was a drummer. We played in quite a few college campuses and sororities and fraternities. I was in a group one time that played in the same show with Robert Young. Marcus Welby, MD, Father Knows Best, he was a movie star. I was in that same group and we were the warm-up entertainment for Bob Hope. You all know who Bob Hope is, or was. He's one of the most egotistical men I've ever met, by the way. Anyway, <clears throat> but maybe he was just having a bad day that day. I don't know. He didn't impress me at all. Matter of fact, I got more laughs than he did at the, at the rehearsal. But anyway, so <clears throat> but oh, how well I remember. One night after playing somewhere, I hit that last thing on my drums and I fell over backwards off of my drummer's seat because of the amount of alcohol that I put in my body that night. I remember then having to go outside and I was sick to my stomach. Had to go down the elevator and go outside. I got back on the elevator. I smelled like alcohol. I smelled, smelled like vomit. I smelled like sweat. I get up there. The guys in the band, they're putting my stuff away for me. I get back on the elevator, take something downstairs, and take it out to pack it up. And at midnight... Some gray-haired lady is on that elevator. What in the world was she doing there at midnight on that elevator? I saw that lady, and I, I, I tried to straighten up. The door shut, and she looked at me, and she said, You deserve every bit of it. One of the best messages I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> it was done by a, a gray-haired old lady. Got back to the house. I was still sick. And because of the alcohol, I spent the next 45 minutes on my knees before the porcelain god with dry heaves. 
to the point my chest and my stomach were hurting so bad. There was nothing left in there. I am so going to stay away from that stuff. I won't even take the Naka. The breath stuff. Because you read on that thing, you, you read the ingredients to Banaka, it has alcohol in it. No wonder Dr. Hiles kept pouring it on his tongue and pouring it on his tongue and pouring it on his tongue. Man, it had alcohol in it. I said, I am not fooling with that. It's got alcohol. I know what it does. I've seen people laying in their own blood and in their own vomit because of it. I'm not going to be controlled by that stuff. I'm not going to give over my life to that stuff. I'm not going to even entertain it. I'm not even going to put one little drop of it in my mouth. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I know it's not good. I know it's not godly. I am, I am entrusted with this life, and I'm going to take care of it the best I can for the rest of my life. I want to live as long long as I can and serve him as long as I can and accomplish as much as I can as long as I'm in my right mind and as long as physically I can do it. I want him to be glorified, not me. I know what it was like to have them driving, going down the road, driving the car, getting home from a job that we played at and they're hanging on. I'm sitting in the back seat next to the back door, and, and they're hanging on to my collar, and I've got the door open, and I'm up chucking as the car's going down the road 55 and 60 and 70 miles an hour. I know what it's like. Ladies and gentlemen, stay away from it. Kids, stay away from it. Got no business putting stuff like that in your mouth and in your body. You got no business putting drugs in your body. You got no business committing immorality. You've got, you've got to be careful what you allow in your eyes, and you've got to be careful what you allow in your ears, and you've got to be careful what you allow up your nose and in your mouth. Listen to me. And these needles and these pills and all this stuff, you need to stay away from it. Why? Because you are built, and God has entrusted that life to you, and you are to spend the rest of your life serving Him. Whatsoever thy find, whatsoever you hate, whatever, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. So the next time you think about taking a drink, you say, "Can I do this to the glory of God?" No, not even a swig, because you know the world knows it's wrong. When they advertise alcohol, it is never with a good picture. Of a, of a good, virtuous woman. Never. <clears throat> well, does what I do glorify God? Does where I go glorify God? Does who I am, or who I'm with, glorify God? You need to have a fire in you to live for Him. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for loving us now. I went over time again, but I pray, Father, that if there is something in our lives, and, and Father, you know, you know, what even I prayed about this morning and yesterday, you know. So I pray, Father, that you will, Holy Spirit, I pray nobody here will grieve you or quench you. If there's something that's been said that has pricked somebody's heart, I pray that they'll take care of it. Realizing, realizing that we should have nothing to do with it anymore. That young man sitting there in that courtroom, facing two to ten years, when he could have had a family by now, he could have had a good job by now, but he kept fooling with it. He kept, just kept fooling with it. He got out of jail, and a week later, he got arrested for stealing $300 worth of stuff from Walmart, and he's back in jail. And now he's in jail for the next nine years. Less if he controls himself, yeah. But I pray, Father, that you'll just speak to hearts tonight. Help us in that area that we are so easily so easily besets us. It just seems like no matter how hard I try, Paul had a struggle, Father, in his life. 
He said, the things that I would do, those are the things I don't do. The things I should do, or the things I shouldn't do, those are the things I do. Paul had the same struggles as everybody else. So, Father, help us not to use that as an excuse. Help us to live right. And that young man, there, there's a verse for that young man. Let him that stole steal no more. The woman that was caught in adultery, Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. The verses in Ephesians that talks about if a man tells a lie, the way to stop telling a lie is to, tell, is to always tell the truth. So, Father, whatever the need is in the people's lives tonight, I don't know what it is. I've not been in their homes. I don't know what they listen to. I don't know what they drink. I don't know what they do. I don't know where they go. But, Father, you do. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and play. Invitation's open. I'm just going to have you stand, if you will, or turn it over to the preacher. I thought that was you back there. No, I'm here. I'm standing right here. <laughs> okay. And turn their hymnal number 167. Father, thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the message tonight. Just pray that each and every one of us we leave this place tonight, that we can remember that we need to keep our lives pure. We need to keep you first in our, our, everything that we do and say. Be with us now as we go our various ways. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You are dismissed. We've got food out here if you need it.